Neil Armstrong. Get on with this. Thank you so much. Six decades ago, the Army Air Corps and uh, the U.S. Government's Aeronautical Research Agency, NACA, contracted with the Bell Aircraft Company in Buffalo to build a research airplane that would fly super softly. It would be called the X-1. X-1 was taken to Pan Pine Castle Army Airfield where the initial glide flights were made, dropped from the belly of a B-29 bomb. Pine Castle was later named McCoy Air Force Base, and after the Air Force reduced their presence there, <clears throat> was again renamed Orlando International Airport. And many of you, I assume, landed yesterday at the same airport where the X-1 made its first flights. And some might wonder why Orlando Airport Identifier is MCO. It's a legacy from the days when it was McCoy, their first place. Uh, the X-1 was moved to Muroc Army Airfield in California, where Chuck Yeager successfully flew supersonic. Ten years later, a half century ago, the Army Air Corps had become the U.S. Air Force. Murak was now named Edwards, and I was there, flying a later model of that same airplane called the X-1B. It was the first rocket craft I'd ever flown. Except for the World War II Link trainer, Aircraft simulators for training did not exist, but they were beginning to be used as a flight test tool. Digital, digital computers of that time were far too slow, too slow to solve aircraft equations of motion in real time. So flight simulation was dependent on analog computers. Lightning fast, but not very accurate. The test pilots of that era, well, let's just say they didn't have any self-esteem problems. <laughs> but they did have a desire to be recognized for something more than white scarves and bravado. And to provide that, they decided they needed a professional society. And so during the first week of October 1957, in a meeting substantially smaller, but otherwise very much like this meeting, the inaugural symposium of the new Society of Experimental Test Pilots was held in Los Angeles with two days of technical papers. I attended that symposium, but the press did not. They were too busy covering another event that had happened earlier that day. A Soviet man-made object had been rocketed into orbit. It was called Sputnik. It was the starting gun of the space race. America's first satellite disintegrated on the pad, which gave the WAGs a lot of fun. They called it Kaputnik. Uh, <laughs> Sputnik 2 captured second place, and America finally took a third with Explorer 1. Both the Soviets and the Americans were obsessed with getting a man into space. Neither was certain just what kind of person could be persuaded to take the trip. Prisoners were suggested. 
soldiers, physicians. Finally, both sides chose pilots. They were accustomed to being closed up in small spaces and, and seemed to actually enjoy being away, away from the Earth's surface. Eleven months after Sputnik, a brand new government agency, NASA, initiated contracts for the construction of a manned orbital spacecraft. President Eisenhower announced this project would be called Mercury. The crewmen for the project were introduced. They would be called astronauts. But they were a little late. The cosmonauts won first and second place with Yuri Gagarin and German Titov, and Americans managed a third with John Glenn. America really got into the space race with the Gemini spacecraft, a two-man machine, the first with onboard navigation and guidance. Earlier spacecraft crews navigated by looking out the window. Hey, that must be Australia. <laughs> Gemini must be the, the first spacecraft with propulsion. Well, it certainly was, and that would permit adjusting the orbit. And Gemini also had a radar and the ability to rendezvous with another craft. Gemini is a wonderful little machine. Using it, I was able to rendezvous with another satellite and make the first spacecraft docking. I also set another record on that flight. In those days, we landed in the ocean by parachute, not a particularly elegant arrival. And, and we hoped there'd be a ship nearby to pick us, pick us up. And with our navigation, this new, newfound navigation system that we had, we took great pride in landing close to the aircraft carrier that was awaiting us. My carrier was located in the Caribbean. I landed near Okinawa. <laughs> yep. It's furthest anyone's ever missed. I don't expect the record to be broken. <laughs> Gemini was the first manned spacecraft to carry a computer into space. Built by IBM, didn't have four gigs or four megs, had 4K. It's hard to imagine just how precious memory was in those days. The computer had 13 keys on the keyboard, and the sole output was one seven-digit register, just numbers, no letters, no screen, no sound, no mouse. But it allowed us to compute solutions that we had thought impossible, changing orbits, rendezvousing with another spacecraft, returning to Earth to a predetermined landing spot. Not bad for a primitive little 4K machine. About the same time, some astronomers designed an experiment. And the idea was deceptively simple. Compute the distance between Earth and the Moon based on the time it would take for a beam of light to travel up to the mirror located on the lunar surface be reflected back to Earth. I, I wasn't one of the scientists on this project. I was, I was uh, more or less a technician. My job in the experiment was to install the mirror. <laughs> so after a three and a half day trip uh, to the site, I set about the job of unloading and setting up the mirror. And the light that was planned to be sent down from Earth was a laser beam. And the timing of the beam's return to Earth would be recorded by an ultra-accurate electronic clock. And the theory propounded that the measurement would yield the distance to an accuracy of somewhere between, accuracy of somewhere between 11 and 17 inches. It may not be obvious why anyone would need to know the distance to the Sea of Tranquility within 11 inches, but we had to some way 
we had to have some way of confirming our mileage for our expense account. <laughs> the experiment was initiated at Lick Observatory on top of Mount Hamilton, southeast of San Jose, California. And as soon as the mirrors were aligned, the scientists fired that laser. I thought they might have given me a little warning. No, no, no. That laser pulse was important to those experimenters. <clears throat> so when it didn't get back to Earth, they weren't concerned. They sent up another and another and another. Not, not. They lost a lot of pulses that night. They checked that big telescope they were using to try to catch the returning light and adjusted their equipment. Finally, success. One pulse. A few more adjustments, and they begin to catch more and more of the little fellows. To hit the mirror with a laser beam required very precise pointing, equivalent to hitting a dime with a rifle from about two miles away. The problem, their problem, had been their use in their pointing calculation of the wrong latitude and longitude of the observatory. The same wrong latitude and longitude that had believed to have been con correct since its construction in 1888. So, first result from the set of mirrors on the moon was finding the true position of Mount Hamilton on Earth. <laughs> and today, 37 years later, the mirrors are still reflecting lasers from observatories around the world. And the accuracy has improved through over the years from that initial 11 to 17 inches down to less than an inch. And that precision has permitted some interesting calculations. The uh, moon is moving away from the Earth at the arrestingly specific rate of 3.8 centimeters per year. And Hawaii is inching away from the continental U.S. And oscillations in the measurements indicate the moon is quite likely to hold a liquid core. And the mirrors have confirmed parts of Einstein's theory of relativity, but conflicted with other parts. And the mirrors are consent, expected to, to continue to, to be busy for many years to come. So many more discoveries are likely, which gives me a nice, nice warm feeling as, as, as a technician on the project. Good ideas. Good ideas and, 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 and good design stand the test of time. You know the old saying, there's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to do it over. If you're good enough, or lucky enough, to do it right the first time, you've created a platform to build and improve on, which will give you many warm feelings as those new discoveries and applications appear over the years ahead. Even if you are lucky and good, getting things right requires overcoming obstacles. That's reality. But that's the spice that makes life worth living. There's little satisfaction in meeting easy goals. Little satisfaction in winning over an easy opponent. Little, little satisfaction in claiming a prize not fairly earned. So accept the problems, they're opportunities. I hope the time you have spent here at Lotus Sphere in the next few days gives you a great deal of satisfaction and that your investments in time and resources and effort will continue to pay off in the future. Just like that mirror on the moon. Thank you. Good luck. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.